Ako mai mai kai te manga ko kopo a fara te awa ko taki te mutu waka ko ngati ka hanganu me rongo mai wahine oku iwi um, ko Pauline Harris a hau nōte fano fanga nōte fano tomato hoki he mahi mahana ki a koto katoa uh, e te fari e tu nei te nākwe e te papa takoto nei te nākwe uh, te mana fenua o te wahi nei te nākoto. Um, Ki ngā tangata no ngā hau e whā, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Kia ora everybody, my name is Pauline Harris. And that little um, bit of um, kōrero or thing that I just said, um, I acknowledged um, the gods of the sky and the earth, the people in this local um, tribal, tribal area. I greeted them and I also greeted all the people who have um, come from the four winds. So everybody who has come from everywhere around the world. Um, so just to give you a bit of a background, um, I'm actually an astrophysicist by training. So I did my PhD at Canterbury in neutrino physics with um, Dr. Jenny Adams. And then um, after that, I got involved. Oh, actually, during my PhD, I wanted to learn more about Māori astronomy. I'm going to talk to you a bit about how and why it's important for us to learn about our traditional knowledge and, and in particular Māori astronomical knowledge, um, which is very important to a significant, um, uh, significant number of the population of our country. And, um, and then after my PhD, I, I'm actually part of the MOA, the microlensing team, so hi MOA. <laughs> so we do modelling at Victoria as well with uh, Professor Dennis Sullivan and Dr Arno Kulpala. So, um, but my primary role um, and my primary funded role is to do a project around the collation of Māori astronomical traditions and knowledge and also around the Māori moon calendar. And we try and tie in scientific aspects that will be useful in, for us to utilise in order to investigate our traditions and be able to understand and recreate knowledge that may have been lost. So it's quite um, an exciting thing to do. And I found that it's a lot healthier too for me to, to go in and um, start learning our traditional knowledge as well, instead of sitting in front of the computer screen doing modelling all day. Oh. Am I still there? So. Hello? Yeah. Is that okay? Okay. So I represent, um, well, two organisations. I better say I represent my university or else I might get in trouble. So like I said, I'm at Victoria University, um, kind of in the School of Chemical and Physical Sciences and then um, in the Māori Department as well at Te Kawa a Maui. Um, but I'm also the chairperson um, or the chairman uh, for the Society of Māori Astronomy Research and Traditions. And these are a, cl um, a collection of Māori knowledge experts. Um, these Māori knowledge experts are some of the most respective, respected knowledge experts in New Zealand and are very highly regarded throughout the Pacific as well. So it's a great honour. Oh, I look quite young, but I'm not. So <laughs> that's why I'm, people always like try and give me advice and stuff. I'm like, oh, I just had my 40th. So yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's why I'm the chairperson as well. My skill is to bring knowledge experts to get together um, so that we can effectively work together to revitalise this knowledge. Um, so we have a significant um, chunk of our um, members are part of the Celestial Navigation Revitalisation people. So we call this Waka Haurua. So these people have been working with the Hawaiians for many years in order to revitalise the ancient craft um, of... Um, travelling across the ocean using the stars as well as the currents and the clouds and the weather in order to travel long distances. Polynesians were known and very, very famous for their ability to be able to cross an extensive and vast Pacific Ocean. And they did that for thousands of years extremely well. Um, so we have Hotuto Oku, we have Jack Thatcher and we have 
um, Heki Nukumai Busby. So they're the real significant people in terms um, of navigational. And at the moment, I don't know if anybody's here from the States or there's any Americans, but at the moment we have uh, the crew from the Hokulia, which is the, one of the first um, Hawaiian um, oceanic um, waka, uh, can, double-hulled canoes, um, that was used to revitalise um, Hawaiian navigation. So they're here at the moment. And after I have to rush off because we're welcoming them, welcoming them as they sail into Wellington tomorrow morning. And then we have, it's very important to have local tribal um, interaction, okay? So I know that uh, there's a few people from Australia, so, but here it's really important for us to um, engage with Māori um, and um, tribal leaders. Um, we make up a significant po proportion of the population, okay? So um, it becomes standard practice for us to engage frequently with um, Māori and Pacific Islanders. You're actually in the Pacific hub of New Zealand. There's a huge number of Polynesians in Auckland. Um, so here we have local tribal leader Taku Parai, who is from the tribe Ngati Tua, which is based in Porirua, um, near Wellington. And then we have other people from different tribes. So it's very useful to have people from different tribes so that we can all collaborate and also connect into the people um, from their local areas and their knowledge in their local areas as well. Um, so, um, you know, there isn't going to be a standard Māori astronomy across all in New Zealand because we're a diverse group. And not as diverse as in Australia, where they have completely different languages, we have the same language, just different dialectual variations. But our traditions can vary as well. So we have from Ngāpuhi, which is in the far north, and Ngāti Raukawa, which is just a bit south from here, um, Oki Simmons, and he's really into the Māori moon calendar in particular fishing by the Māori moon calendar. So about 20 years ago they were a bit dismissive about you know, the effect of the moon in terms of fishing and the cycles of aquatic species. These days they're more open to it and uh, there's actually a professor here, uh, Michael Walker, who's working on that, doing scientific experiments, investigating that. Um, other um, knowledge experts, um, Takiri Rangi Smith, um, and he's a master carver so he builds big waka big marae, those big meeting houses, um, and he's also a knowledge expert, he's also been gifted a PhD on top of the PhD he already had. So, um, so he's but very humble, like you wouldn't, you know, he's just right, really quiet, but um, extremely knowledgeable. Then we have Dr Rangi Mata Moa, who's um, our um, principal investigator for our large Māori astronomy project now, and we just recently got awarded a Marsden, I don't know if Marsden is like the big grant, so we're very, very happy that we got one of the big Marsden grants. Um, and he's at Waikato, and then we have our vice um, chair, which is Tor Waka. So they all have different interests in terms of Māori astronomy. There's lots of different aspects. Um, Dr Rangi Mata Mo is more interested in the linguistic component, how was star knowledge um, used in language. So if I called someone the star Canopus, kōkwe, Call Atutahi, I would be likening you to someone who stood apart from the rest, who was um, someone of significance. Okay, because that star stands away further from the rest of the main pack in the Milky Way. Um, yes, okay, so carrying on. So now I will. Yeah, okay. Um, so here's just some little action shots. Um, Hōtūrua, who I talked about before, you know, they go out all the time, they educate our young. They're currently trying to recruit young members. Um, unfortunately, it's 18 to 26. So, I don't know, there might be some in here that age, but they're recruiting people, <laughs> recruiting people to teach them the art of um, doing long-distance voyaging. And they regularly do that. And uh, we'll just skip through. And here, here, I just have to show this because that's when they gifted him his PhD on top of his PhD, which is always nice to say, you know, very clever man. But um, the person he's standing next to is Hector Busby. He was one of the ones that were fundamental in bringing um, celestial navigation and revitalising it in New Zealand back in the 70s. So he was one that really started it with some of the Hawaiians. 
the reason why celestial navigation is um, oh Hang on, I'll just jump to this. So just to give you an idea about what our core objectives are. So our core objectives are, of course, and preserve and revitalise our traditional knowledge uh, pertaining to Māori astronomy. But it actually goes broader than that, and I'll show you um, soon, because even though you think of it just as the stars, it actually um, infuses its way to many types of traditions and beliefs and ways of just living in a traditional context. Um, another thing of ours is that we actually, you know, we want to be able to revitalise our knowledge, so our knowledge we call Mā Tauranga Māori, but we also want our children to have access to scientific uh, career paths and scientific knowledge. So that's a really big thing for us. So um, a big part of it is going out to our communities and interacting with them, doing outreach with them in terms of science and trying to encourage them into some sort of career STEM pathway. Um, and then, so in order to do that, we have, we have a research program, then we have an education program, and we try and grow our people up from when they're young um, to engage them in education outreach when they're very young, so the youngest people I've ever had are five, which was really challenging. Um, and then also to have annual events, and uh, that's quite important, especially with the Māori New Year. So that's just a bit, I better just put up what our projects are. So there's our um, grant, which is Te Māori a Fiti Toy, the sky is a cultural resource, Māori astronomy, ritual and ecological knowledge. So I'm on that with um, Dr Rangi Mata at Waikato University, my first cousin, uh, Dr Hemi Whanga, and myself and some other people at Waikato. So we were quite happy about that. And at the moment I'm fully funded by the ministry, uh, what we call MB, Ministry of Business Innovation and employment, they probably should be here. Um, and that's actually more concentrating on traditional calendars and uh, the relationship of fishing um, and the Māori Moon calendar. And there's some other projects. So in terms of Māori astronomy, so Māori astronomy actually infused its way through uh, much of tradition and culture and beliefs. So of course we start off with cosmology, the stars are very important, as in many other cultures, um, with the cosmological models and the creation of the universe. We also have, especially in terms of agriculture and, and fishing, but these are all part of traditional calendrical systems, calendar systems. So, you know, we might have heard about these in other cultures, okay, but no one's actually done the work, the hard yards and the work to truly understand um, a Māori perspective on these um, areas. And then also, of course, uh, prophecy, you know, prophesizing thing, uh, future events based on astronomical um, events that have occurred. Um, and also, um, my friend was very interested in the linguistic record. And uh, you would see a lot of star information found in chants, in um, so more tiatia chants, whakatokia proverbs, proverbial sayings. You will have them in prayers, which are karakia and you'll have them in waiata, which are songs. So there's a lot of information in those, but you have to be a language expert really to understand. Um, understand. Current language I'm trying to learn is C++. <laughs> <laughs> so, which drives me crazy. I don't know, probably drives everybody crazy. Um, yeah, so just to give a cultural context and why we actually have to even bother trying to revitalise and collate our knowledge. Um, so you have to have a cult you know, have to have a historical context of you know what what's happened because actually we don't get taught about it in school why things are the way they are, um, and that's part of control mechanism from way back, which is set. So you know, uh, dominant um, uh, education system which doesn't allow for Māori knowledge to blossom. So to give you a context, Māori arrived here about 800 years ago. Um, but when we arrived here, we had knowledge that had been developing for thousands of years in the Pacific. Okay, So they come here, but then they, when they get here, they have to modify it for its, the current weather conditions. And it's a lot warmer up here, but if you go down to Wellington, you know that you really have to significantly modify your practices because it's really cold. 
and some of the food they would have been used to growing up there would not grow down there. Um, and then um, contact with Abel Tasman in 1642, but real contact with James um, Cook, Captain Cook, in 1769. And unfortunately, as has happened in many indigenous cultures, um, introduced diseases had huge decimation effects. Um, well, yeah, um, yeah, decimated our population significantly. And if you can imagine, if we had a disease that decimated our population, a lot of our old people would die, a lot of our knowledgeable experts would die, um, and a lot of our young people would die. So it affects your ability to be able to continue knowledge. Um, and then other things which suppress um, the continuation of traditional knowledge. Um, more so, not so much the Tohunga Suppression Act of 1907, but indeed the Native Schools Act in 1867 was significant, I'll explain that in a moment, um, flow from rural areas into um, the cities. So if you have um, a village or a, what we call a hapu, sub-tribes or a tribal group, you have a structure, you have your knowledgeable experts, you have your families, but when people move... You, you truncate um, your ability to have knowledge flowing from the higher knowledge holders down to the lower. Okay. Um, and then, so that affects your knowledge loss, you end up with knowledge loss and you end up with uh, language loss. And therefore, we end up with not really knowing that much. And then we have to set up these projects to find out. Okay. So the Native Schools Act was really interesting. I really found out about this in the last couple of years, see, because we're not taught about it. Um, so the first schools that they had at the beginning were taught in Māori. Um, and so they were taught in Māori. Um, most Māori knew how to read Māori, and this is by the missionaries. And then um, uh, they could also, some of them could actually write Māori. Um, but what happened is that after the land wars, they introduced this Native Schools Act, which said that the schools, they set up um, public schools, and then those public schools were only allowed to be taught in English. So that truncates, you know, language is the method of knowledge transfer. Okay? So if you truncate the language, you truncate the knowledge flow. Um, and that's all part of um, assimilating a society into something that they want to create. Um, also, in my parents' generation, they got the strap if they spoke their own language in school. Okay, so as the education system developed, um, Māori, uh, Māori knowledge and Māori language were sidelined. So we had a significant impact in what we knew. So, for example, when I was at school, like, I'm just saying this is just all the facts, right? Um, there's no pointing fingers, we just all, I'm about solutions. Um, um, but when I was at school, we learnt about Rangi and Papa, which is the Sky Father and the Earth Mother in art. And I think I learned how to do one to ten and some colours. Yeah. I think there's some Kiwis here that would know the songs with the colours and the numbers. But yeah, so it wasn't very much. But these days, um, you know, we're really addressing this problem. But we need to address it more. Because our current population is 684,000 and it's growing significantly. In 50 years' time, half the country will be Polynesian. So we need to address this issue, we need to address it quite significantly in order to be able to prepare for our future population. So we need them to be culturally competent in who they are, but also we want them to be competent in many areas, including science. So we've been revitalising lots of knowledge over the last 30 years. We've been re trying to revitalise our te reo Māori, our Māori language, for the last 30 years. They set up schools for the little ones. Well, the little one's gone now. Um, but yeah, for the youth, they're called Kohanga Reo. They set up Māori schools, which is Māori language schools, and um, they've been revitalising their language, growing practices, a whole lot of things, which is really exciting. Well, we're really excited. I think it's important for other people to, to know what we're doing. Yeah? Um, so here we have um, oh, just an example that the navigators were really a significant... Um, start to revitalising Māori astronomical knowledge. So let's just move on. 
Um, so in terms of Māori astronomy, um, we read the kind of real big push for revitalising it occurred in about the 1990s or early 2000s. There came about this resurgence of the practice of the Māori New Year, which is based on primarily the stars Matarihi, which is Pleiades, and the star Rigel Puanga. Okay? So we know that the stars rise, um, that we can see certain stars at certain times of the year. Um, yeah, so these were the two stars that we used as the indicators for the Māori New Year. And that occurs around about June. So with that huge um, revitalisation sur- resurgence, we um, started to embark on trying to collate our astronomical knowledge. Yeah, and so we started that. I thought it would be a three-year postdoc. <laughs> and uh, mm. I think I'm at year seven. I can't remember. I've lost track. That's okay. My friend laughed at me, and he says, oh, it's at least 20 years, Pauline. So, yeah. Um, so I think it's important for us to just go through some of these aspects that I went through before. So remember that Māori astronomy is infused in different areas. So we'll start off with the cosmology and we'll talk a bit about the calendrical systems. Um, so our cosmological origins start off from what, something called te kore, um, which is, um, some people call it the nothingness, but really it's kind of like the potential, the potential for something to form. And then what came out of the nothingness was te pōr, or a whole series of phases called the night. Um, they have the, um, they go like te pōr uri uri, te pōr tango tango, te pōr te kitia. There's a whole, like, I can give you four points up here, but there'll be pages and pages of what actually goes in, and then a whole lot of information that fills in those pages as well. So multiple layers of information. And then from that, we say that the Sky Father and the Earth Mother came about, and they actually were trapped in their embrace and love, and they um, procreated and had many children. They had about 70 children. So of those 70 children, a lot of their children um, were the ones that ruled or up in space. So we have... For example, the god of the forest and the creator of human beings is Tani Mahuta. Or the god of the sea is Tangaroa. If you go to Hawaii, it's called Kanaloa. So they change the T to the Ks, R is the L. Um, and Kane is their god of the forest, I think. So Uh, What they say happened is that these children were actually trapped in their parents' embrace and they plotted to separate their their parents and basically rip them apart. So there's a whole series of narrative around the different eons of time that it took to push them apart. And and so when they were actually pushed apart, uh, in some of the narratives it talks about how it's Tane Mahuta who actually adorned his father. So... In this, we have um, Il, which is, to some they say, is the supreme being, or the supreme god. Um, That's debated whether or not that's actually real or introduced concept um, from Christianity. Um, But they say that Il um, instructed another god, Rehua, which could be Sirius, we'll start at Sirius, um, to get Tane um, to fetch the baskets of knowledge. And within one of those baskets of knowledge contained the sun, moon and stars. Um, And in order to do that, he travelled up the 12 levels of, not really heaven, but 12 levels of something. You know, sometimes it's hard to to translate it properly. But 12 realms in order to fetch those baskets and to fetch the sun, moon and stars. Um, In order to understand our relationship with the stars... This is something we, we try and, you know, some, you know, we can say, oh, well, we're all made up of stardust, and from a scientific perspective, yes, okay, um, but from a Māori perspective, um, or a traditional Māori perspective, we were created by Tane Mahuta, who was the god of the forest, and he mounded some clay and blew life into her, um, who was called Hine Ahuone, and then they created humanity. Whereas 
the Rangi and Papa, the Sky Father and the Earth Mother, created these two people over here at the top that then created the Sun, Moon and Stars. Okay? So that's our relationship in terms of that model, if you want to call it a model. I like calling it a model. It's just different people's interpretation of their understanding of the universe. Yeah? Um, so in terms of um, how the sun, moon and stars got up into the sky, it was actually Tane who um, went to go and ask his cousin, oh, I forgot his name, well, he went to ask one of his cousins to take up, um, use his canoe to take up this basket up into the sky. So they went up into the sky and they went and started putting all the stars nicely into the sky. But then he kicked over the basket and then the stars all fell out. Um, and spread out across the sky. So he left them there. Yeah. So that's how and why they look like that. Spread out, out across in a... Because he just kicked it over. And then they left the, the waka, or the canoe, up there in the tail of Scorpio. Yeah. Atamaririti. It's called Te Waka Atamaririti. Which is the canoe of a person named Tamaririti. So to give some sort of understanding about just some of the main um, constellations and the main star groupings um, uh, that uh, Māori um, had understandings of. So this is uh, Te Mangaroa, which is the Milky Way, and um, Te Mangaroa is also known as Te Ikau Māori, which is the fish of Māori. It's known as the, the parent of um, the god of the sea, um, and also it's named after some other um, entities, um, one of them in particular for my tribe called Paya. But that's a whole other story. We won't go into that. We have the sun, which is, um, you know, we personify not just our environment around us, but we personify the stars and the sun and moon. So the sun was a mas of masculine form. So he was a male, he had two wives, um, and so his first wife was Hene Raumati, which is his summer wife, and then he had also had Hene Takuro, which is his winter wife. And that has to do with different stars in the sky. I'm still getting my head around that, but, but that's okay. Um, uh, and there's a whole lot of legends and narratives around um, the sun and the slowing of the sun to do with Maui snaring the sun and slowing it down. Are there many Kiwis in here? Was it? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, no, Maui. Maui. <laughs> slowing down the sun. We, yeah, we learned that at school. Um, and then we also have marama, which can be masculine or feminine, depending on which narrative you read. Um, but in this one, it's not a man and the moon as such, even though the moon will be personified as masculine or feminine, but there's actually a woman in the moon called Rona, and with her, uh, she's there with her a cabbage tree, Tikoka tree. And what happened in that one is that um, Rona was walking along and she was going down to collect some water with her, in her calabash um, down at the river, and the moon was lighting her way, and then the clouds covered the moon, and she looked up to the moon and basically called the moon a cooked head, which is a big insult. And, um, and so the moon reached down and grabbed Rona and then dragged her up, but she was trying to hold on to the cabbage tree, and then they dragged her up into, and she ripped out the tree as well, so carried them both up into the tree. So you can give that a go and see if you can find Rona and her cabbage tree. Yeah, because some people can. I'm, I kind of think I've seen it. Uh, you know, it's hard when people don't show you, and because, you know, there's not many people around that, you know, know where it is. Um, here's Sirius, which is called Takurua. Um, Hine Takurua, one of the wives of, um, one of the wives of the sun. Um, and it also could be Rehua as well, so that's just variations, um, tribal variations. Right, you guys don't need that. You should know where everything is. If the pictures are upside down, uh, never mind. Sometimes we just grab them from different places. Um, here we have Te Taku Ohi, or the Southern Cross, sometimes known also as Mahutonga, which is actually to do with um, it being a plug hole to the southern winds. Okay? Um, and some other interpretations, it's known as the anchor to the waka of Tamaririti, who was the one that took up into the sky and 
spread all the stars are forth. Um, so that's one interpretation of it. Give the talk to the kids. Um, <clears throat> and here we have the pointers, which are actually the rope connecting to the anchor. And then we have the Scorpio, which is the waka. So see if you can um, draw that one out. And then we have Puanga, which is really significant in terms of the Māori New Year. Um, <clears throat> and that's just an example of, oh, that's Stellarium actually. Yeah, that's something I'll come into in a minute. That's just some of the um, constellations that we've put up there and some of the planets. Um, then also Māori astronomy in terms of central systems. I'm still working on some of the relationship in terms of the sun and how that was used, um, but we all know that the sun moves across the horizon, um, well, appears to move across the horizon, or rising at different yeah, places and then yeah, moving back and forth for your equinoxes and your solstices. But more importantly, it's the stellar cycle which is important. So we have a whole lot of stars that we use, we used to use to tell the time of the year. So even specifically months, okay? And whether or not that was used in conjunction with an alignment on a certain um, ridge or mountain or whether or not it's just when it rises up out of the ocean or above the horizon uh, really depends on where your tribe is and your onography or your round in your environment. So that's why it's important to collate the knowledge in terms of iwi-specific, tribal-specific knowledge around the world, uh, around the country. That makes sense? I should know all the basics of astronomy. <laughs> okay. So I said before about Matarihi and Puanga being really important for the Māori New Year. So around June, we'll see Matarihi rising up above the horizon, and it's the heliacal rising, which is really important. So that's the rising um, just before dawn. And um, this could be, um, yeah, was it? I can't remember the date it was this year, whether or not it was the 12th of June or not. But somewhere around about June. Um, but it could also be in conjunction with a new moon or maybe a full moon. It really just depends on what tribe you're from. But um, other people who were from different tribes got a little bit annoyed because they're like, well, hang on, my tribe uses Rigel. So um, we had to have a strong acknowledgement that they use that star Rigel because it's very important to them. Yeah. And so that's actually for quite a significant number of tribes in the far north um, towards the west coast in Taranaki as well as in Naitahu down the South Island. And there's been a part of this huge resurgence of Matarihi here. It's just been huge. So you'll go into different, like the Hawke's Bay, they'll have celebrations for a whole month. Um, Te Papa was really big on revitalisation of the practice um, and of the discussion around it. And that's how I started, actually, by giving a talk at Te Papa way back in the day. Um, how long do I have? Like two minutes? Or long? Oh, we've got five minutes? OK. Um, another um, cycle is the moon cycle, as I mentioned before. Um, and instead of having a seven-day week, we had a 29 to 30 phase, um, yeah, phases of the moon. And um, it wasn't midnight. This took me a wee while to get my head around. I was like, oh, yeah, I must look over at midnight, which is stupid. But, you know, when you're used to something, you know, a transition happening at a certain time. But actually the transition is a tidal transition. Okay. So when a tide occurs, then it's the new phase. It's like your new day starts at midnight, your, your new phase starts at a certain tide. Okay. Um, and then within these, we actually have different descriptions. So if people give you a maramataka or a Māori moon calendar, they'll go, here you go. It's got to be used for something, right? Okay. So what they used to use it for was planting and fishing primarily, but also for business as well, conducting business. Um, and so we have examples here. Bad day for planting and fishing, the sea is disturbed. Good day for planting from midday to sunset, good night for catching eels. So they have, for each phase, descriptions of that. And this is about survival, 
And this is about being smart and not wasting your energy and resources going fishing when there isn't going to be anything there. And I don't, I think it's quite, I suppose from a modern perspective, sometimes I do find it interesting what people used to be dismissive about. Because really, you know, females are lunar, animals are lunar, species are, you know, not all of them, but a lot of species are lunar as well. So they might get hungrier at a certain time. So they'll come out more in abundance trying to find food. And then another species will go, hmm, they're out more, we'll come out more because there's more food. And then the whole cycle continues. So it wouldn't be a simple you know, set of equations to describe that. It would be really complex. You probably need some grid computing. But yeah. Okay, and in terms of a contemporary context, the practice around the Māori moon calendar is really is building momentum, but not as much as the star Māori astronomy knowledge. Um, but we're working on that. And it's quite interesting, uh, the Auckland City Council has become really interested in the Maramataka, and they're starting to implement or looking at implementing some of the practice around planting to do with the Māori moon calendar, which is great, and I think it's particularly relevant for here since they've got such a high population of Māori and Polynesians. Um, so just a bit, I'll just flick through some of the things that we're working on. So basically, we're trying to collate the knowledge. We're looking at all these different areas of Māori astronomical knowledge. We're looking at manuscripts. We're interviewing people. We're looking at chants and songs. Um, and we're also trying to conduct experiments to understand what the, um, the narratives are talking about. We're trying to conduct um, observations. Um, we're even going into the planetarium, asking them if we can play with the dome, you know, because that gives you a good idea of when stars rise and form, what does that really look like? Because you actually have to really look at it. Sometimes it's not good enough on a flat screen. Um, and so that's been really important. And what we're trying to do is, you know how we can do all this research, right? But what are we going to do with it? Okay, and I think I'm quite passionate about making sure it gets out there. So make sure it gets into our curriculum and to our children. Okay, Because there's not much point doing it or no one else is going to find out about it. Okay, so what we try and do is that we're looking at, well, one of them's a large publication. If anyone knows anything about Māori astronomy, the last one, the last good one was written in 1922. So my colleagues working on that. Um, storybooks for kids, anyone knows the magic school bus? Yeah, based some similar kind of thing. Okay, anyway, I'm currently working on that. That's to do with Rangi and his dog. Um, yeah, anyway, they go up into space. They learn about Māori concepts. They learn about scientific aspects, similar to the Magic School Bus. Um, also, star maps. If anyone knows a good, really good quality star map program that, you know, you can go and modify it and it produces a high quality one that we can muck around with, please let me know. As I've been trying to find, like, one that you don't have to give them the information. You know, you just want to use the software and develop it because some of the stuff we're not allowed to share yeah so if you know anything please let me know um also oh, i've already been through this sorry uh yeah oh the other cool thing was stellarium so stellarium was good because you can get the code and you can just you know <coughs> modify it to be able to put it in and then you've got your own modified version you don't have to give it to them yeah so that's that's been really good and really really useful we're just trying to tackle, um, you know, trying to put the images in, which that's uh, going to be fun. Because it maps it, and when you change the view of the sky, you know, it's going to do a transformation. Yeah, anyway. Okay, so I'll just, oh, we do have a website, and we have a Facebook page. So martyastronomy.co.nz if anyone's interested, and we're also on Facebook. And just rounding up. Oh, this is one cool thing you'd probably like, is that we have an education program called the Star Smart Program. We go out to very rural areas, so I went out to the Uruweras, which was really interesting trying to get out there if you're used to just driving around in a city. <laughs> it was all gravel road. But we went to a Māori school out there, and it was really cool because when we got there, they're like, oh, they, they said in Māori, okay, inside the classroom, you can speak English but outside you have to speak to Hawaii, which is really 
for us it was really quite, oh, that's so amazing. They're very strict that they have to stick to their tribal language outside the classroom. They let us speak English inside the classroom because I wasn't competent enough to um, deliver it in Māori language. Yeah. That's a, quite a significant thing of your Māori. It's like really admirable that they're so staunch. So anyway, we, we went out and did this program. What we try and do, just to give you a look, if anyone wants to do an Indigenous program, mixing it with science and stuff, I like, yeah, we've got a really good outreach program at Vic, um, but we do stuff on planet hunting, of course, um, and, uh, but we also try and incorporate little games you do with particle physics. You know, we get in the throwing a ball, trying to mimic a neutrino detector. Trust me, you can do it. You can do it with lollies and a sheet. And you get them to throw the ball and try and hit the nuclei, which is the lolly. If they get the lolly, they get it. And it's quite hard, but they're determined. And, um, and you know, just basic things. Um, yeah, super, we, we're lucky we get to take a superconductor if we can. And, yeah, just some other things. But we make sure we tie it all in. Um, to Māori knowledge and also inspiring them and having positive role models because there's actually quite a lot of us that we're just not visible. So in conclusion, um, we're very passionate about what we do. We're trying to revitalise our knowledge and we need to revitalise our knowledge because our population's changing. And it's important to us, of course, that's, that's the main thing. But we need to address it as a country um, and uh, make educational knowledge more relevant for the populace that are coming through in our educational system. And we need to be ready and kind of looking forward to our future. Um, and also, um, it's really important for us to get out to the communities as well and do a lot of outreach. And I, I really do enjoy that. Get you out from behind the computer. So thank you very much. Yeah, that's, that's all. Thank you.